Hi, and welcome to the Sports Doc. We're, uh, we're back, Mark. I mean, it's been a long time. Uh, we, uh, we're trying a little new uh, wrinkle this year. We're going to try uh, doing some video po uh, uh, podcasting and see how that works out. But as always, uh, we're going to try to bring you up to get, get on the world of uh, sports and sports medicine and how injuries affect uh, uh, your favorite players, but maybe yourself too. Over the next few weeks, we'll have some ideas how to, for you to contact us. I think one of the best ways is once we're on YouTube or once we're on our, um, on our normal channel, you guys can make comments and ask some questions in the comments, but we'll have some other ways for you to get in touch. But this is kind of trying to work this one out, man. Uh, uh, as you know, I'm an orthopedic surgeon and sports medicine specialist at OAA Orthopedic Specialist. Um, been working with Mark for... 15 years, 15 14 years, years and uh, Mark's been going through a whole bunch of changes. Uh, one of the best uh, certified athletic trainers I know. Um, then, because of the healthcare system, how messed up it was, um, he had to go back to school for his uh, physician's assist. I mean, for for his uh, physical therapy assistance uh, uh, certification, and has been working doing that, doing a great job in the clinics. But um, bigger and better things have come, and so now um, Mark's working with uh, uh, with outpatient. Uh, well, I'll let you explain it. Well, currently um, we do. Uh, the two companies I work with are Symmetric Sports Performance, and uh, at Symmetrics we do um, preventative injury training for all levels of athletes. It started as a an overhead injury company, but now uh, we take care of uh, um, marathon runners and uh, distance runners, and we take care of uh, a lot of different types of athletes. Anybody interested in the world of of, of um, preventative injury training. The other company that I work for is a uh, home health care company that does pediatric home health care. So um, I uh, have expanded kind of what I do and taken my, uh, my, my, my skills as an athletic trainer and a physical therapist assistant and uh, transitioned that into uh, home health care and trying to help uh, very sick children. And I enjoy both worlds and that's really the reason for the change. It's amazing how, you know, your background as a certified athletic trainer, all the things that you've you guys learn and all the just the skills that you get not just in taking care of patients but organizationally and uh, as far as administratively how it's almost a natural you know natural progression for you guys to be some type of administrator some type of you know uh, management uh, position to work things out we have a lot of friends that start off as ATCs and now are CEOs of companies and things like that so uh, your athletic own... training is uh, it, it, it's a quite a profession because exactly like what you said you're you're a clinician you're you're an administrator um, you're uh, a communicator um, and you're you're dealing with a lot of different moving parts and that's Literally what I do now is I'm working with many different facets and I'm just trying to make sure that I, I bring all levels of care together. And that's what athletic training is, is you are, uh, you're on the ground, your boots on the ground, but you're also trying to make sure that you're managing what the coaches are dealing with, what the doctors are dealing with, what the parents are dealing with. And you're trying to manage all those things together. Well, sometimes your athletes need a specialist, tying them into the occasion and being all, being kind of the head of the care team. And that's, that's what athletic training really is at its core. Well, as we know, the one thing that hasn't changed no. is your love of sports. No. <laughs> and, your, and your constant talking of sports and actually how injuries have affected. We, you know, it, it's funny, we, you know, wherever we are, it doesn't matter if we're in a clinic or at dinner or, or just hanging out with kids. We end up talking about the same thing, so we figured, eh, might as well film it. I think our wives would agree with us. <laughs> and they actually said, you know what, instead of talking about this in front of us, why don't you go in front of the camera or something? You know? It's true. It's true. <laughs> so, you know, let's, 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 get, let's get going on it, man. It's the first, well, uh, first, first uh, week of, uh, 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 it's actually the second week of football mm -hmm. is, now, is now done. Um, you know, it's... Uh, uh, Already, there's some things going on that I know a lot of our uh, listeners and our, our viewers now, I guess, are, are, are paying attention to. So I'm going to let you uh, start. Well, the first injury that we wanted to talk about, Dr. Palumbo, and this is something we wanted to discuss last week, was Ronald Darby, the, uh, the newly acquired cornerback for the Philadelphia Eagles, obviously acquired uh, by the Eagles in that trade for Jordan Matthews. And uh, 
Ronald was a bright spot in the preseason, trying to Good fill down. a big hole that the Eagles needed in their secondary and, and definitely a weakness at corner that they've had for a long time. Um, and now Ronald Darby gets in, plays very well in the preseason, plays very well in the beginning of the game at Washington, and then suffers an ankle injury. And the reason that this is extremely important is because on the telecast uh, and then in the subsequent reporting afterward, we heard that Ronald Darby had a dislocated ankle. Uh, and he was his return this year was probable, and that those two statements really don't make sense in the world of sports medicine, and that's why we kind of have to delve into this and discover what was dislocated in that because a true ankle dislocation is nothing that Ronald Darby would come back from this year. Absolutely not. You know, when we talk about the ankle, it's kind of a complex joint. Um, You have the part of the ankle, which is really considered the, the, the true ankle, is what brings the foot up and down. Okay, and that's the ankle joint. There's a bone that fits right on the end of the, of the leg bone, on the end of the tim, uh, uh, shin bone, that allows the joint to go up and down, up and down. And that, if that gets dislocated, a whole lot has to go wrong before, <laughs> before, uh, before that comes out. Fractures, ligaments, tendons, normally that's not, that's not one you're going to return to this from the season uh, with, because uh, usually there's fractures associated with it. You have to put the fractures back, and and uh, and that's usually pretty bad. The other part of the ankle joint is the you know some people call it the low ankle joint, some people call it um, the uh, uh, the subtalar joint. It's really quite technically called the subtalar joint. That's what allows the foot and heel to move from side to side, and that's what really accommodates to the field and accommodates to positioning. Um, you know when you're cutting, that's what allows the the foot to be in just a, just a much better position. That's completely different. The subtalar joint, when it dislocates, it could be disastrous. And that's why hard to make that call initially, like how long is he really going to be out? Because sometimes you're really lucky when that subtalar joint comes out. It just pops out. It's like one of those very contained bony joints that if it just pops out, all the injury is like a sleeve and it just scoots off it just it's like pulling off a sleeve and then you could put that sleeve back in and back on when you um uh, when you reduce the subtalar uh, dislocation so you know initially what happens he has a subtalar dislocation it's out obviously they uh, emergently reduce it whether it be under general anesthetic or or with blocks and things you can get it done sometimes as you know, when you're on the field, sometimes things can go back in real quickly before. But there's, let's just say it went back in. Then they get the MRI. Once they got that MRI that showed no fractures, okay, and no tendon injuries, tendon tears, then they know they're dealing with just really more the ligamentous injury here. Um, and once they know that the ligamentous injury is you know, like I said, it comes back as a sleeve. It got, as, sometimes it actually feels like suction, like that, when it comes back. Um, once after that, you know that the, um, every, you know, the structures are, are generally okay from the MRI, the biggest problem with this injury, as you know, is stiffness. Mm-hmm. So you get these things moving right away. You don't cast them. You don't, you know, mobilize them. I mean, if it's a, if it's a closed injury, the, you could be in an ice bath and the ice pools just moving this thing up and down, get, controlling the swelling, as you know, uh, controlling the pain, and then getting motion back. Once you're getting control of all that swelling, all that motion, and then you're really starting to work on the motion and starting to work on the strength, then it's just a question of how long is it till his motion is good, his strength is good, his balance is good, that you can tape him up and get him ready to play. And that's safe. You know, again, my job as, a, as an orthopedic uh, sports medicine physician, I always say that our main jobs is to protect the player from himself, from his coaches, yes. from his owners, yeah. and in a large portion from the population we also take care of from parents. Yes. So, <laughs> so um, you know, we would not let him get back if there was, you know, some injury or, or problems. But this is one that you advance almost like a, a bad ankle sprain where is once you get the motion back, once you get the, the, you know, the, the functionality back, um, you could usually brace this in, a, in, a, in an ankle brace or taping 
that it would be safe for him to get back in. Um, recurrence is not high on these things uh, because of the fact that really the first thing that happens is the scarring just comes in. So that's what you want to pre prevent on him. And that's going to be, especially as a, as, a, um, as a skilled position, you know, if this was an offensive lineman, I would say no doubt he can come back this year, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know with, the, with the extent of his injury. Cornerbacks have to be the most athletic people on the field, without a doubt. I mean, I, I mean, you know, you could you could say, you know, quarterbacks are most important. Cornerbacks are the most athletic. Mm -hmm. They have to react to what somebody else does, okay? And and so they have to be ready. So I, I, I don't know. We'll see. I mean, I'm glad they're optimistic about it, but we'll see. You know, and, and the interesting part about what you were talking about is how athletic a cornerback has to be. That cornerback has to be able to backpedal. And it's, you know, the secondary is the, the main area of football that needs to be able to backpedal. And these guys can backpedal as, almost as fast as they can run straight forward. So losing a step in that regard and being as highly regarded as, as a, of a player as Ronald Darby is, that is one of his main strengths. Right. So first he has to be able to backpedal. And then out of that backpedal, two main motions occur. Either a plant and drive, so that means he needs to be able to get his feet underneath him and exp accelerate forward or he needs to be able to rotate and the rotation is the other part of this that really can slow things down and what you had spoken to about this injury is is how the foot need the the, the joint is what keeps the key, the foot from moving medial to laterally that is a rotational movement when we turn and we pivot and go from a back pedal, um, which is essential in all of sports. But out of this position, it's even more essential, that rotational injury. We always talk about rotational injuries as part of a high ankle sprain. And high ankle sprains, that term that uh, is used, we don't necessarily like it in the athletic world. But it, it the, communicates a, right. a different People injury. generally understand what the term high ankle sprain means. And a high ankle sprain is worse than a regular ankle sprain, right. which we don't like that term either. <laughs> but um, the, the, And the, as we go, <laughs> you guys will get this. The rotational part of that is the key component to this. When is he going to be able to get into a comfortable back pedal? And when is he going to be able to make rotational movements effectively? And that's what he's going to be working with the training staff with. Yes. I mean, that is like, you know... The orthopedic surgeon's part, orthopedic phys physician's part, is kind of out of it at this point. Yep. I mean, if it's if he's checked that it's you know joints back in in position, the the cartilage and the and the uh, bony structures are okay. Uh, would imagine some bone bruising, but the, the, that will get better. Uh, and the ligamentous structures are in place. Then it's like, okay, it's all yours, baby. <laughs> now you look good or bad because I got did my job, and that's really. I mean, he's probably working, you know, in a professional setting, probably two sessions of four hours a day. At least. Chris yeah. Peduzzi and his staff down there in Philadelphia are some of the best in the National Football League. And the, uh, the interesting part about the treatment of this is exactly what Dr. Palumbo had said. We get a lot of different times where parents and athletes will put themselves in a situation of a professional athlete and, well, I had the same thing that Ronald Darby had. Or I had an ACL tear and Adrian Peterson had an ACL tear and Adrian Peterson was able to make it back in four to five months. We have to understand the level of care, the level of training that these guys go into it with. And a lot of the athletes that we take care of are at the high school level and younger. And, and they're still developing body. So we cannot compare ourselves to professional athletes. Listen, the professional athletes are essentially freaks of nature. Yeah. Uh, they are... They are truly supermen, you know, uh, the, what they've had to go through and the, you know, the, uh, the uh, trial of, uh, of basically just making it, it puts them in a subset of, of humans. Uh, and so you can't compare to that. And again, like you said, high schoolers have maybe a half hour of treatment, maybe, you know, once a day with their athletic trainer, but most high school athletic trainers are dealing with a few hundred, mm -hmm. few hundred kids at a time. They can't get the they can't get the care that these people are getting. It's one of the problems with the healthcare system as it stands right now. You know, they're cutting back on the rehab portion of the care of the patient because it's it's easy to cut. You know, it's, it, people don't think about oh, people could do that exercise on their own. That never happens, and it's never good. And we'll, like I said, over the next. As weeks come, we'll be talking about that a lot, I'm sure. So, yeah, that was uh, – so I'm, I'm curious to see when he's going to get back. It will be, um, 
you know, it's going to be uh, interesting to watch. It's going to be interesting to watch. I think one of the big fantasy injuries as we get to, because that's a lot of what people are interested in as well, is when is your player going to be back on the field from a fantasy perspective, and how many weeks is he going to miss, and how effective can he be? And one of the most injury, the, the, the two big fantasy injuries that we're looking at this week are number one is Jordy Nelson, and that's going to give us a, talk, a chance to talk about muscle injuries. Jordy Nelson, the fantastic wide receiver for the Green Bay Packers, and one of Aaron Rodgers' favorite targets, uh, and and, uh, you know, Jordy Nelson is also listed as one of the top 10 fantasy players in all of, of the NFL right now. And uh, Jordy missed some time last week, left the game early with a quad strain. And uh, we hear about muscle injuries all the time. And this gives us a good chance to talk about muscle injuries uh, because muscle injuries are so variable. Um, they are, the, Jordy Nelson has not been ruled out of, of competition yet. However, this is something that could plague him all season. Which is interesting. And, and yet, you know, sometimes you have to hear the, the verbiage and, and, and how they're actually describing injury to get you know, exactly what we're dealing with. We know the injury is within the whole quad mechanism, mm-hmm. you know, which is, is a big, long area to talk about. Um, you know, there's, there's tendon injuries on both the upper and lower part of the quad. Then there's injuries where the tendon goes into the muscle. And then there's tendons within the muscle belly itself. Normally, you know, um, normally if they said a strain is a tear, a, you know, so you could have a grade one strain, grade two strain, or grade three strain where it looks like you're pulling away, you know, two pieces of steak, okay? Which is basically what you're doing. That's exactly right. <laughs> so, so when they say he has a calf strain, it's interesting. Normally, if there was a tear and he was going to be out for a while, Okay, and there was an obvious tear, grade two, grade three, you know, they would have said tear. Because that, 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 so I'm, I'm happy to see that they said strain. The, the big question is, where is that strain? Most common place for a strain in the quad is at that where, where the tendon meets the muscle in the upper part of the thigh. Um, the good news is, is that there's a lot of blood flow in that area. Okay, wherever you have meat, there's blood flow. So whenever there's muscle, there's good blood flow. It's when it's in the tendon that you really have to worry about. And so I would say my guess looking at this and looking at what they're saying about his chances of return, my guess, again, I don't have any direct information about that, this is a grade one quad strain. However, again, we're talking about a skilled position. Somebody depends on explosive power, okay? And what that quad does is helps you explode, okay? And so you're looking at Jordy Nelson, you know, it, it's, it's, I think, it, you know, the last thing you want to do at, you know, week two of 17 in the season is rush him back, mm-hmm. you know? Um, and so I'm interested to see what you're thinking, what's going on right now in that training room. Right now they have, okay, Mark? You know, and th- this is a good this is a good example to talk about um, how things work within uh, the dynamic of a football team, uh, and it occurs very very similar in the major collegiate setting and the NFL setting as well as far as uh, how we deal with it. Um, Jordy Nelson has a quad injury. We know he sustained that in uh, the beginning part of the game, and then the Falcons have gone on to uh, or the Falcons went on to annihilate the Packers. <laughs> and when those types of things happened, um, the dynamic in the coach's room changes quite a bit. So Dr. Palumbo's right. The actual way to handle this is to make sure that he's ready to come back and can explode because Jordy Nelson makes his living down the field, has very explosive down the field power. He does work well underneath and in those short routes. However, the, the ball in his hands and his speed is what separates himself from other receivers in the league. We know that he's gritty and tough. There's no doubt about that. He's a farm boy, and we know how those farm boys uh, are from a toughness perspective. And the concern of that is is that Jordy pushes himself to get back too soon. So the dynamic right now is that the athletic trainers are trying to gauge how Jordy is from a functional standpoint. Because I guarantee you if Jordy can play, or he even has an inkling he can play, he's going to try. He'll be the one fighting. And that's, that's that's the dynamics that I love in the training room. Uh, yes. it, it, it's a the, the the fact that you're you are getting to know 
55 guys, 53 guys, mm -hmm. real well. That's the importance in the pro game of knowing, you know, there's a trainer there or there's a set of trainers there that get to know these guys because they all have different personalities. Every one of them has different personalities. And they all have different relationships with the ATCs. They have relationships with the docs. Mm -hmm. They have relationships, you know, you have some that, you know, um, could be a little bit more protective of them themselves and some that, you know, they don't get to the pros without having a mentality of that warrior mentality. And so it's almost scary to think that, you know, part of what the job of the, of the training staff is to hold them back, put the reins on them. Mm -hmm. Because the last thing, the last thing you want to do as a trainer is say, okay, I think he's good and convince everybody, let's, let's put him out on the field. And his first step off the line is he goes from a grade one strain to a grade three tear. And you're like, and I'll tell you right now that it, there's many times in our careers where we have both made a call with an athlete and the entire game, you, you're not sitting there enjoying no. the game at all. You're just making sure that you made the right call and that you're proven right during the game. And that's, that's what goes on in athletic trainers and team physicians' heads is that you're worried about, I, may, I know I made the right call, however... Yeah, that's why it's called we the practice the game of menu. <laughs> completely medicine. different than most people. You yes, know, it's, uh, 100%. We, we definitely do. So, um, so I think Jordy, what they're you know really what this comes down to is is controlling the amount of swelling, making sure that he has motion. Uh, it, it's very simple um, in a muscle injury. Uh, we have scar tissue. We understand that. If you get a cut on your skin, we get that blood flow to fill in, and you get a clot there, and you get a scab there, and eventually that scab wears away, and then you have that nice pink tissue underneath it, and the body remodels that all multiple, multiple times. The same thing occurs within the muscle belly itself. So really what we have to do, because muscle functions differently than skin, we actually need it to move to help drive us and move us and run and cut. We need to control the amount of scarring that occurs at the site where he had the tear, right. where he had the strain. And the level of scarring that will occur will depend upon how bad the strain is. So we really have to take this time. It's a fine line to walk. I want to make sure that he's healing and we're laying scar tissue down to let it heal. But we don't want to build it too fast, too quick. Because if we do, then we're going to start to develop loss scar. of motion. And then that's very difficult to battle. And many times, the nagging portion of the injury when it comes to a muscle injury, a quad or a hamstring or a calf injury being the most common, is the fact that the re-injury during the season isn't necessarily a, a worsening of the injury. It's a tearing of the scar tissue, which creates its own swelling reaction. And now we just get built, we build more scar tissue when we tear up scar right. tissue. It so becomes the, just a bigger injury, longer to take care of. Absolutely. You know, the, the best time to get it is initially. Um, and, you know, we're, you know there's a, we're doing a lot more modalities. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, when I start off, 30 years ago in training rooms, you might have mobilized that injury, right. you know. Uh, then they started putting that injury in, like, hyperflexure knee, and you're going to keep it there and lock it up there for a while. But now they, we know <laughs> that's a year older, too. So, so now, we're, now we're getting to the point where we're putting the science of healing, the physiologic, you know, healing with the science of taking care of them. And so we know that you know, the body responds to movement, the body responds to pressures that are put on it. Um, and, but you gotta, you gotta walk that line. You gotta, you know, you gotta, uh, uh, being too aggressive, being not aggressive enough. So um, that is the science of, of sports medicine, why you're in that real time in that, in that uh, training room. And we're gonna get into a lot of different techniques throughout these shows about where we talk about doing soft tissue mobilization and the different techniques that are available for you to mobilize soft tissue, and I'm very anxious to talk about that because it's one of my favorite topics. Yeah. And it's also one of the topics that if you're ever injured and have to go to physical therapy, that you will learn to abhor. So, <laughs> <laughs> No doubt. <laughs> the other big fantasy injury of this week is Greg Olson, the fantastic tight end of the Carolina Panthers. He's one of the top players in his game. He's a fantastic, one of the greatest all-around tight ends that maybe ever play the game, too. Uh, and a great person as well, as we know. Correct. Um, but Greg uh, revealed that he sustained a foot injury uh, during the Buffalo Bills game, and it turned out to be a fracture. And when we look onto what bones are fractured, 
Um, we don't know uh, because we haven't gotten any reports on the specific fracture, and that's what we like on this show is we get a chance we get to, to speculate, speculate all over and the talk about the foot in itself and how a foot fracture can be devastating to a player of Greg Olson's size and stature. Well, again, I've been looking for reports and, and looking about what that fracture was, and you know, one of the most common fractures that we see is that fracture of the fifth metatarsal, um, and that is... Um, the fifth metatarsal is the bone. Uh, it's the it's the bone on the outside of the foot, and what happens is that in a lot of players that that's a source of stress, and that bone could actually break uh, break just by repetitive motion or by twisting the ankle. There's a lot of ways this uh, bone could be fractured. There's also a lot of where that bone is fractured also makes why how you treat it sometimes it's just that the tendon was pulled off the tip of that bone um, and it's more like a sprain equivalent to get that person back but if that bone breaks um, more at the uh, more at the midfoot part in like the in like the the larger part of the bone that almost always in a professional athletes needs to be fixed surgically where a screw is placed in that bone um, we see that a lot. That's one of the most common fractures that we see in the foot and ankle um, in, in athletics. And I'm thinking that may be the injury. What I'm hoping the injury is not is a Liz Frank injury, okay? Liz Frank is the midfoot joint, and it's, uh, it's an interlock joint that really establishes the arch and the rotation of the foot against the ankle and the, and the forefoot. And it's a devastating injury when it happens and sometimes it shows up as just one little fleck injury and really not until you get your MRI do you actually see what that injury is. So those are the kind of injuries that we look at and we go now we got to wait for the actual bottom line report. We'll be able to know with are they going to be talking about surgery? Are they going to be talking about just rest? Are they gonna be talking about major surgery out for the year? Because with the, with the fifth metatarsal fracture, what we call a Jones fracture, you could put a screw in there and within four weeks he could be playing again. Mm -hmm. Whereas with, the, with a Liz Frank injury, that's a nine month, 12 month injury to get back. So it's a whole, we're all waiting to hear. But I would say if, you're, if you have your fantasy list out, you may want to check, <laughs> you may not, not want to check that box for a while because it's going to be a while. Yeah, you're probably going to be looking for another tight end or making a trade to improve your uh, y your tight end position this year. And Dr. Palumbo, one of the things that uh, that we we are concerned about with the foot in general, um, the larger the individual, uh, the more concern. And uh, one of the biggest um, stories of recent about an individual with a foot injury is Joel Embiid of the Philadelphia 76ers. Right. And a lot of Sixers fans can attest to you that. They have had enough feet for the last two years, and they just pray that that foot holds up. Uh, and Greg Olson is in the same boat as right. uh, Joel, and, Joel Embiid. Think about it, though. Think about what a basketball player does. I mean, we remember back to Larry Bird when his, mm -hmm. basically his career was ended by a foot injury, just a simple foot injury. And this was the Jones fracture that we were talking about. Um, but everything starts at the foot. Every contact with the ground starts with the foot. Um, and really, you're thinking about, you know, when you think about the physics, okay, and you think about what's above and what's, you know, how much pressure, how much weight, and how much shear force is going through that, that foot, and how much just direct pressure is going on that foot. You've, you've screened a lot of basketball players, mm -hmm. okay? How many guys have, are 6'8", are maybe weigh about 240, yeah. And have the flattest dogs you've ever seen. Every single one of them. Okay, every <laughs> single one of them. And you can't, a lot of them you can't accommodate with orthotics. You can't help the fact that they're running up and down the field literally every, you know, uh, you know for 90 feet back and forth, you know, for 48 minutes. And in practice, they're just doing that over and over again. And the bigger you are, the more stress you're putting on that foot. And, it, you know, they've come a long way with shoe wear. They've come a long way with orthotic insoles. Mm -hmm. But they haven't done anything with the physics, mm -hmm. <laughs> okay? And that's where the, the problems occur. And when you see the difference of the kids that played in high school and college from those, you know, maybe 23-game seasons 
to going to a you know 82 game season and beyond. Mm -hmm. It's you ask the you ask the freshman after the first you know I'm talking about freshmen in the NBA first year rookies in the NBA. You ask them what they felt like in February. Mm -hmm. They feel like they're dying. Yeah, because they have no idea what these what just the ongoing repetitive you know flying getting on a basketball court, you're playing, flying, getting on a basketball court, and just never getting a chance to rest. So any of these smaller injuries can become bigger injuries. And then once you start getting injuries of the foot in a basketball player, it can be devastating. I mean, you know, look at, look at Grant Hill, what he went through for years. Yeah. Look at Yao uh, Ming. Yao Ming, look at what he went through for yeah. years. You know, there's a lot of examples, especially in, in football, I mean, in basketball. Um, where that, where I can't blame the Sixers fans being, uh, but it's, it's what it is. It, it is, this guy's maybe dealing with this the rest of his career. And I think that the, the, the foot in general, obviously that it's the physics of it, as you mentioned, the bigger you are, the more weight you disperse through your foot. And, um, a, a good friend of ours, Matt Babbitt, who deals in custom orthotics will tell you right away that we have all sorts of great material out there, but at some point in time, the more weight that I load into this orthotic, the less and less it's going to be effective. So, um, again, the, the physiology of our athlete has grown to the point where we are bigger, faster, stronger than they have ever been throughout time. And the uh, bracing and the taping and the orthotics has not been able to catch up to that. And it probably never will, of course. Uh, there's nothing like the human body and there's nothing like physiological yeah. tissue. Uh, but, again, these are injuries that we see more and more and more every year that maybe 20, 30 years ago were a very rarity. And uh, now um, we deal with quite a bit of these in every sport across you know, the board. Basketball is one of those things that you, I look at, too, and I, and I look at the summer leagues. Um, as not necessarily a good thing. Yeah, okay? I agree. I mean, NBA basketball is so long, mm -hmm. you know, and the body has to recover. And it seems like a lot of these... Now, obviously, the longer guys go into the playoffs, the less likely they're going to play in the summer leagues. And, you know, there's a, there's a, um, a lot of guys that are trying to play themselves up in the summer leagues. And I so I understand the business purpose of it um and, and maybe from the um from the um up and comers that I, that I understand but it doesn't give them an opportunity to rest the stress on the body of the nba is one of the worst i mean you're not dealing with um uh, you're not dealing with a lot of um uh high impact injury you're dealing with repetitive injury mm -hmm. you know it's similar to baseball that way most baseball injuries are repetitive injuries uh, basketball, the same thing. Obviously, there's a there's a knee injury, you know, the ACL and those kind of things that can be devastating the an and the ankle sprains. But when you look and you're in the, you know, you're looking at those 12 to 15 guys that you have traveling with you, you know, and, and you're in that training room, you're just trying to, you're just trying to keep them going. Yeah. And especially when it comes to that February March time, it's 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 sometimes devastating what's going on, and. You know, that's, NBA is often a, a league of attrition. You know, it's who makes it healthy at the end of the year. And, and it's because, like you said, the size is so much different. The strength is so much different. The, the speed is so much different. And it just puts people, just puts people at risk for these, you know, higher, you know, more energy that's absorbed, the more chances that that energy is going to create an injury. You know, and this overuse injury is another topic that you're going to hear from us down the road because we enjoy talking about that as well. Right. Um, so, Dr. Palumbo, this has been a fantastic th chance to, to get back on the air with you, man. Um, We'd love your comments. Uh, again, this is kind of our first try at this for the uh, uh, for what we plan on doing for over, uh, hopefully, weekly um, on an ongoing basis. Obviously, maybe we'll have some uh, some. Uh, breaking news yes. segments at times at times uh but we uh we're going to create our um, um our our youtube uh presence and uh, and hopefully uh you guys will enjoy it and uh you'll give us a chance uh, to let us know what you think what we can do better what you want to hear about maybe maybe let us know which injuries you want to talk about we're also the idea of this is to talk about injuries about our favorite athletes so we can explain 
in our general population, it's the same injury. Uh, and we'll try and we try to treat it in a very similar manner. So it's a way of teaching you about these injuries through the uh, through uh, through uh, the unfortunates of the of the of our professional and college athletes. So this has been the Sports Doc Show with uh, Rob Plummo and Mark Miller. Uh, we will certainly be back, and um, hopefully everybody has a good, healthy week. Good luck on your fantasy teams, and we'll see you next week.